there. This is Kipley Brown, and I am a human being, relatively speaking, and I never listen to the G&T show ever. Hi, I'm James Kerwin, uh, director of Yesterday Was a Lie and RUR and Star Trek Continues. Uh, I'm told there is a thing called the G&T show. I have no idea what it is, and I don't care to know. G&T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discussion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Our friends with benefits. <laughs> Speaking of having a good time, Terry, mm-hmm. Dayton broke <laughs> the G&T show. This is now the David Mac <laughs> Appreciation <laughs> Hour, you asshole. <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much? With his purple velvet cape and his crown. I thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne. I am awesome! <laughs> Look what I have done! <laughs> Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go nyan 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 nyan. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I say it. I'm going to pry a little. <laughs> dare you? How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd cramped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show. That's right. And welcome, everyone, to another edition of the GNT Show Supplemental Logs. Well, very special one tonight. You can tell by Terry because she's wearing her black sequined uh, party dress, as you can tell there. I think that's the one you wore on New Year's, isn't it? I, I haven't washed it yet. Oh, it, God. It's got <laughs> acid stains. <laughs> oh, and to my right, your left, there he is, our resident Klingon, today wearing his Argentina uniform for the World Cup, Ceridium. Ole, ole, <laughs> kapla! And we have two very special guests today, or as I like to call them, complainant number one and complainant number two in the restraining order roundtable. First, we have the beautiful and lovely and talented, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know her from Enterprise, and she's been in Star Trek Continues, and several other things we'll talk about, the lovely Kipley Brown. Greetings, all. And also equally as dapper and lovely is director, writer, and just swarthy-looking gentleman, James (laughs) Rookman. Hello. My swarth is legendary. (laughs) It is legendary. (laughs) It is legendary. James knows how to wear a suit. That's all I'm saying. He does know how to wear a suit. Well, thank you. Welcome. (laughs) Welcome, both of you. We're so excited. And uh, again, for everybody who is going to be attending Star Trek Las Vegas, which is many of our listeners. James and away Kipley. at this point. I'm so excited! Don't James and Kipley are going to be uh, at our booth. Kipley especially. I know James is going to be doing his swarthy thing around the vendor's room, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the beautiful things is the court uh, put a stay on the restraining order against me, so Kipley can stay at the booth. So I thought that was very nice. Of oh, no, no, no. You can't be there while I'm there. That's if you would a three-mile radius, so. Three miles? Jesus, I can't even be on the strip at that point. <laughs> you can't even be in the hotel, I so. Uh... <laughs> But they'll lift it just for, you know, and no one knows what really happened, so. It's true, there was no video, because somehow those cameras got knocked down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm missing a leg, you guys. I'm not going to say how it happened, but it has something to do with this incident. (laughs) There there were... were, were Rumors of a plenty. Unless you all, unless you all think it was me, I'm the one that woke up and said what happened. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> we had it coming. <laughs> I am. I'm just very excited. I still feel. I still feel bad for that. For that poor, poor the, the bus boy janitorial yeah. staff <laughs> to clean up that mess. It's oh Vegas my! Nothing they haven't seen before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. And I thought that part of the settlement was what stays in Vegas. You know what happens. The Vegas stays in Vegas. I don't, I'm just saying. Well, we're yeah, just talking about script. Actually, this was a script idea, is what we're talking about. Uh huh. <laughs> I love it. Sure. I love it. Okay, first and foremost, let's get it out of the way because we're just so damn excited about it. Oh my God, you guys! Star Trek continues episode three. What the? Uh, Yay! <laughs> 
my that first, was awesome. My first viewing, these were my two words when the credits rolled. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> well, thank I, you. <laughs> that's, that's a high shut up compliment. It was a shut up day. I think I posted something on Facebook, not on, on Like It. I think it was shut the fuck up. I was amazed. I, now, not, that's not to, and I don't want to downplay how awesome the first two Star Trek Continues episodes are, but for some reason, I think it has everything to do with, well, well, first, the direction was great. The lighting was amazing, and the casting and the acting was spectacular. The Helms woman was hot. Yeah, the Helms <laughs> woman was hot. I'm just saying she really was. But it was also, she's such a diva. <laughs> 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 Is um, It was just the entire package just seemed to... It and was perfect. It was perfect, and it was a, a, a spectacularly written episode it, that tied in so, so well with uh, the original is a mirror mirror episode so congratulations to you and to the entire Star Trek Continues team yes. because you guys knocked that one out of the park thank you so my, my, my package has often been described as perfect so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it. I was going to ask him about his package damn it <laughs> No, but thank you very much. We uh, an enormous amount of work went into this went into this episode, really did. Um, and uh, we just have an amazing team of people. From Vic, who plays Kirk and is the executive producer, co-writer, uh, Matt Busey, the director of photography, who knows how to shoot stuff so it looks exactly like it was shot back then. Really, really great guys. Chris White, the AD, Casey Shasky, the UPM, uh, Lisa and Tim, the makeup guy. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. They're great. Yeah, and the guys and, and the guys who who built and maintained the set and converted yeah. it to the mirror universe. Um, Will Smith, but not not Will Smith as in not that Will Smith. <laughs> right. Royal Weaver, mm-hmm. Sam Rooks, all those guys. They're just amazing. The, what a, Michael Bednar. My first what the fuck moment and that was I literally had to pause and look. I really thought that that was Barbara Luna when I first saw uh, yeah. Marlena appear on, on the screen. Well, I here's, like you guys had somehow you know Forrest CG'd. It. Here's, yeah. a, oh. here's a hilarious story. Um, Vic and Lisa and Tim him, the makeup supervisors, were shopping for wigs um, for, uh, I think, for uh, Uhura and Scott in this episode because they had to match their season two hair. And they're at this wig shop and they see this woman who looks exactly like Barbara Luna. And he says, like, look, look over there. And Vic's like, oh, my gosh. And so they go up to her and they start talking to her. And uh, that's the, the rest is history. So, yeah, that's how she was found. Literally. Shut up. Bumble-a-bar. Really? <laughs> Boulevard. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Out on what street was she discovered? Hollywood. Oh, God. That's just so funny. I, was, just I, was so awesome. I think it was a wig shop on Hollywood. Yeah. But she's already an actress. That yeah. She, right. Well, that's just, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's an just actress. too cute. I yeah. love that. I love yeah. that story. I had no idea. So yeah. tell, me that, tell me she understood what she was going to be no, playing. She was not. I mean, she remembers watching Star Trek when she was really little with her dad. She doesn't. She didn't know anything about the Star Trek phenomena at all. Um, now she's totally into it. Um, <laughs> she's going to be at, the, at, at Vegas. She's going to be at our screen in Vegas. She's got a panel in Vegas, too. A oh, panel. Sweet. Yeah. So, yeah. So right the, on. Now, uh, Star Trek Continues has a wonderful relationship with TrekMovie.com. And you have gotten together with TrekMovie.com. And TrekMovie is actually kind of sponsoring a showing of Episode 3, correct? Well, let me... Uh, Wonderful is is an exaggeration. I would say strained, um, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, 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 Trek movies. Anybody else just look around the studio like what just happened? <laughs> I'm completely kidding. We love them. Yeah. Kayla. Yeah. Swarthy James. Swarthy James. Kayla Yakovina, who um, has been uh, uh, editing Trek movie um, over the past year in in Anthony's absence, but uh, he's back now. But she's still their science editor. She writes for Geek Magazine, used to be a reporter for NPR. NPR, right. Uh, She's amazing. Dr. Iacovino, no less, right? She is now a doctor. She is. That's correct. And um, she is, uh, I mean, this is a person who actually actually literally lived in Antarctica for a while. Like, right. that's not the coolest thing in the world. I don't know what And it is. volcanoes, right. too. It is know, in volcanoes? not figuratively, literally the coolest thing. Um, so... <laughs> So, um, so anyway, so Kayla put this together uh, in conjunction with Vic and us, and um, yeah, the AMC on the Strip is screening episode three of Star Trek Continues midnight Thursday night slash Friday morning, um, and so there's going to be a screening. It's a free screening. You have to get your tickets at the box office there in advance. There is a limited number of seats, but it's a free screening, and then after that, there's a and a session with me, Vic, Chris Duin, Kipley, Asia, who plays Marlena, and uh, uh, Michelle Specht, who plays McKenna, and Michael Ford. 
so Michael Dorn looks like he's going to be able to make a little appearance yeah, for you. Dorn will be there, yes. That's so Terry, awesome. Terry, so you know why? If you haven't, I don't want to give away any spoilers. No, I, 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 I'm, so, no, don't give away spoilers. Okay, Terry, two thoughts. Maybe yes. July 31st, be there. <laughs> July 31st slash August 1st. When we so roll, I'm thinking it meant Wednesday night when we said midnight July 31st. No. And, oh. and Nick, what can Terry, they get? Oh, yeah, if you attend, you can get a Buck Bakai rookie card, people. <laughs> A Buck Bakai is rare, and it's signed by Buck Bakai! <laughs> okay. That's true. Good. That's true. Damn true. Now, Terry, so, little production meeting on the side yeah. real quick. When we yeah, roll okay. up to Vegas on Tuesday, we should stop by the theater before we go to the hotel and get our tickets, and that way we can go to Guardians of the Galaxy on Friday. I don't, no, think, we're going to... I don't know that the tickets will be available before. Oh, they oh, will be for us. We'll make sure. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, we've already decided we're doing a big Guardians of the Galaxy thing on Sunday night after yeah. the con we'll be out is for done. Two days then. Yeah, well, I know. We are, we are, our opening is competing with Guardians of the Galaxy. I feel bad for them. But, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> it just works That's, out that way. Yeah. Now, now, were either one of you in Australia for the showing there? No, only the only the six main cast members minus Todd, um, who who couldn't go. Um, um, were were uh, allowed to go to Australia. He uh, was a main cast member. Huh? What's the saying? No, no, I think there were series, series regulars. The yeah. seven series regulars. Yeah, members. the series regulars, right. She's my helms. Oh. Well, so how did I, you break Michelle's leg? Okay, here's what happened. Um, Michelle tells me about a month in advance, oh, I broke my foot. I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, fortunately, you're not in this episode very much, and we can shoot around it. Then, I, they get, apparently what happened was for weeks, the cast and crew had been planning this flash mob, and, um, <laughs> and, and they had been practicing the dance. Michelle had been practicing the dance at home, and that's how she broke her foot, um, or sprained <laughs> And uh, and Vic and I had no idea what was going on or why she broke the foot until the flash mob happened on the last day of Bruce. And it was Pharrell Williams happy. Yeah, everybody started dancing to happy. I have been addicted to yes, that song that awesome. for like the last month because I was in kind of one of my down phases, and you can't be down with that song playing. It's well, true. go and on got... video or YouTube and you can watch the entire flash mob dance sequence. Well, you know what I've been addicted to? Is if, if, you wanna, if you want to see Kipley dancing in a mirror uniform, go, okay. go to YouTube. Well, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Sorry. (laughs) We lost Nick. Nick Jiggle, that's not sexy. Kipley, we lost Nick. No, you don't understand. We lost You know what I've been addicted to? Somebody put together a Soul Train stroll, like a bunch of... I saw that. A Soul Train soul line, you know, stroll line to that song, and it's absolutely fantastic. It really is great. Now, now, when it comes... Now, back to uh, the continues, because I know that we have so much to talk about. Yeah, there there was the Soul Train squirrel. The big Um, squirrel, yeah. You guys are get used to our squirrels. We do chase them on occasion, and we apologize ahead of time. The- I do have a comment and a question. Go for it, Mike. Okay, my, my comment. Now, th- this this is a, a good thing, but I thought it was way too short. It needed to be longer. You left me wanting way a lot more, so <laughs> kudos. Going on. Always. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, my next question is, please tell me there, you guys will be back for more Can Star Trek Continues, because there, you guys, are, it was just phenomenal, and I, I would love Love to see Kipley in yeah. the regular universe as well as James behind the camera again because what you guys have done is amazing. Thank you. Well, to address both of your questions, well, I, I'll, to, I'll do for a minute. Um, to address both of your questions, um, first of all, the length of the episode was something that Vic and I said from the beginning we're not going to be married to network time constraints, even though technically the episodes were 50 minutes back then and TV shows are about 40, 42 minutes now. Um, a lot of the original series has been cut down to 40 two minutes in order to fit syndication. Um, And we kind of felt that because this is a web series, we want to just tell the best story possible. So if an episode comes in at 35 minutes, if an episode comes in at 80 minutes, we don't care. Um, We're just going to do the best story we can. In this particular story, and we have had some flack for the length of it, um, we we decided from the beginning that if we're going to show Spock's rebellion and mutiny, it's going to either have to happen gradually over a long period of time, which would mean a multi-episode arc, or it would have to happen like whiplash fast, like so mm-hmm. fast that Kirk didn't even know, like within hours.
powers of getting back to the Enterprise, Kirk is, is, is usurped. Um, and we decided, well, we're certainly not going to do a multi-episode arc, but we will do, so we'll do, we'll do it quickly. And um, the script was actually 51, 53 pages, something like that. Oh. But it was so tight, and there was so much action and moved so quickly that the episode came in at 41 minutes, and we have no apologies for that. And if people have a problem, <laughs> You should not have any apologies. No, it was I mean, phenomenal. That was the best way to tell the story. And people said, oh, you could have padded it out with, with some more dialogue. Well, there was actually a conversation between Smith and Uhura that was cut because it was not necessary. We felt that there was no reason for it. Um, so, it, 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 I mean, we... we but it was an awesome conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so emotional. That'll be on the Blu-ray oh. extras. But, uh, I was going to say, is it going to be in the Blu-ray extras? It was, and, no, I mean, it's really... Uh, the episode is the length it needs to be to tell that story, and that's right. what there is to it. Um, and that's, manhole, just a man holding the women down again. Mythical <laughs> mirror oh universe. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, well, it, it, that gets to straight to the heart of what what G and T show is all about. The the motto of our show is it's all about story. And what we like to discuss is the process of creative types in how they address their respective arts. And James, as the director and as one of, as a uh, the script writer on this one, you you were dealing with with a story that had already been created by Vic, correct? Yes. And so you got to work with Vic in, how did that collaboration between the two of you work to take a story that he had in his head and get it into a minute a page? Oh, it was great. I mean, that's that's what I do best. I mean, I'm not a writer. I'm a director. Um, He's a writer. But, but I like, <laughs> I like it, when I do have to write, I like writing other people's stories. I like taking an idea that somebody else has and shaping it into a screenplay or a teleplay. Um, that's what I did with R.U.R. That's what I've done with a lot of plays I've directed. But not Yesterday Was a Lie. Not yesterday Was a Lie is pretty much the only thing I, I originally wrote, and I, I don't know that I'd really want to do it again. Um, mm. And this particular episode, Vic came to me and said, this is the story, and uh, I thought it was awesome. We sat down over lunch one day for several hours and broke the story. Um, and, and for people who don't, breaking a story means you just go through the beats of you know what happens here, what happens in this act, what happens in this act. And then um, I went home he started typing it into a teleplay, would send it to Vic. Vic would edit it, make changes to the dialogue, send it back. I'd make changes, send it back. We went back and forth for a few months. And that's that's the collaborative process. So and when you when you talk about breaking a story, it, it's the two of you kind of almost verbally storyboarding yes, it? Yes, and, and, and this ties in with the earlier question of what's in the future. Um, I spent most of the day today breaking episode four with Vic. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. What'd you just say? What? Say that again? Who? Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Episode four. Oh. We're so happy. Please yeah. tell me there's Romulans. The other thing that's, that's, re- that's really funny is that, and I, and I have to say this, and I'm not saying this for, for any reason other than addressing what you said, probably the, the main comment that we have gotten on Facebook and the other message boards is, oh, oh my God, I hope we can see Yeoman Smith in the Prime Universe now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got a fan club. We have had more people say that, I think, than anything else. Are you sure they want Yeoman Smith or Yeoman Smith? I guess I'm the only one that wants her likes. Mm. Uh, Well, you you shouldn't have taken that one of mine off. (laughs) (laughs) Again, it was an accident. Well played, Kipley. Well played. (laughs) Now, I I have a a clarification question. When McCoy was being all evil McCoyish and injecting stuff, was that Nurse Chapel with him? No. Okay. I I wasn't sure. That's why I'm asking. They made the decision not to use a Nurse Chapel in in this series, um, she hasn't been necessary, and frankly, canonically, at this at by by this point of the five year mission, which is late twenty two sixty nine, she would have had to have gone back to med school in order to be a doctor in the motion picture. So um, we don't have nurse chapel. That may have been the single cool. most geeky thing we've had said on this show, and, and that's, that's not something. Here. I am that is awesome. Yeah. That almost made me wet. That Thank was you. so exciting. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, at least duh. Don't think I didn't hear the. Oh well, I mean, come on, guys. So <laughs> part of part of the great thing about Star Trek continues is that their their goal is to tell the story exactly the way it would have been told in 1969 if a fourth season had happened. But at the same time, never violate canon. So if it's absolutely necessary to reference something that happened in Enterprise or the motion picture or whatever, it's, it happens. But it happens in a way that's um, a, that, that's kind of obscure and kind of just like tangential to the story, 
Uh, like in Lulani, there were references to things that happened in Enterprise, but they were very tangential to the story. Uh, so that's kind of the philosophy. But like things like, where, where is Chapel? Well, she wouldn't have been there at this point. Where's Rand? She wouldn't have been there at this point. You know, um, Eventually, we're going to have to promote Chekhov and Scotty and Spock, because Chekhov was a lieutenant JG, and Spock and Scotty were both full commanders by 2270 when the Enterprise went back to dry dock. So all those things, we, we, are, we pay attention to that stuff. Oh, that's just so, awesome. That's so <laughs> exciting. It, um, I love that stuff. And that's exactly what every you know, geek fan like me, especially fan fiction writer like me, that tries to do the same thing, and that is adhere to canon. And we pull out all the research material, and we watch every episode, and, we, and you, it just shows the attention to detail that your entire, uh, that the entire crew and Vic's entire group has really, uh, it really shows. It just, it really shows. And even if you're not a, um, a, a super fan or a geek fan or a canon, a canon geek like I am, it, it doesn't matter. It, it flows so well, and the characters were so true to form that somebody who had never seen Star Trek movie before, I think, would truly enjoy yeah. uh, Star Trek Continues. It's just then. Now, I want to kind of talk to you, Kipley, a little bit about what we just talked to James about, about the process. And um, as an actress, what happens, uh, what, did, what happens? when you first get a script what is your process about attaching yourself to a character the hardest part is really reading the script for the first time without uh, if, if you know the character that you are auditioning for that you're playing without already trying to oh yeah I'm going to do that I'm going to do that I'm going to do that but you really can't you got to like for me the first time I read it I have to read it as if I'm the audience member watching it so from the outside point of view and that helps me get a, like a bigger scope for the whole thing and then I go through and like sort of look at the, the character and the character development and the beats and yeah, it's always different, though, depending on each character. Um, I've had different processes. They just kind of, they come and they find me somewhere, somehow. In no, and it's just exercising. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I, and, and I'm going to jump to another project that both you and James were involved with in the past and that I absolutely adore, and that is Yesterday Was a Lie, which is... If for any of our listeners who have not yet seen this wonderful independent film that James produced and was and directed and was produced by Chase as well, correct? Yes. Okay, Chase Masterson was, but stars Kipley as Hoyle, who's one of the main character or is the main character of this. It is. How would you describe it? A sci-fi film noir. Um, yeah, so you could call it that, or a, a metaphysical sci-fi film. Metaph- metaphysical is probably a better description. Um, how did you get involved with Yesterday Was a Lie, and how did you react to the initial script for that one? Because that must have been something else. Wow. Well, James and I already knew each other. We were, we were already friends. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really funny, because he didn't know this. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure he did not know this. Um that in high school I used to compete in like acting competitions and I loved the idea of a female hard-boiled detective. You know, I, I this was, uh, I, I know they've done it a couple times, like V.I. Warshawski, which I haven't seen, but like I really loved that idea of taking on the sort of the typically male role and I did this like, comp- like competition with this character I made like a created called Scarlet Black. Um, and then uh, to get into the mood for that character, I always used to listen to Harlem Nocturne. Um, I don't know if it's, it's like that bluesy kind of kind of saxophonic, depending on the recording. But na 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 na. That says like film noir. And James came to me and showed me the script and said, "I want you to audition for it." And I read the script and. I wanted to eat it. That's how much I liked it. Uh, I, I well. it. But it was every. It was this character that I never thought I'd get a chance to really play. This type of a character. And it's funny because one of the first times, or it might have been when I was called back, um, we were auditioning in a studio that was next to a music studio. Oh no and way! They started. They started playing Harlem Nocturne. Shut the- up! And I was like, what? This is like divine intervention. So fortunately, I got the part. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, just because we're friends with him, I automatically, you know, we had to see if I had the chops to do it. Um, 
Oh, yeah, you did. And, trust and, me. No, well, well, I know you really do. It, it was so good. It was so good. I'm, I'm always taken aback. I, I have, I have, I go around to my friends that haven't seen it yet, and I will go and I will buy. I will try to find a cup and I will buy it. And I will give it to my friends going, you have to watch it. That's, I love this movie so much. It is so, it is so unique. And um, one of the things you'll love, if you ever heard me before, I bitch about immensely is um, how originality is kind of lost in Hollywood lately. But I'll tell you, I highly recommend Yesterday Was a Lie for anybody who wants a truly unique story. And it, it, it meets it with, with everything. So I'm, I'm what, and now, and now we no, can No, no, thank you. But let me, let me, let me correct Kipley on one thing. What's that? Um, I Uh-oh. didn't, I didn't go to Kipley with the script. What happened was Kipley and I hadn't really been in touch for quite a while, and her agent submitted her for oh. the role. Her agent oh. for, for this part. Um, I had known her, but I wasn't really familiar with her as an actor. And so I was just like, oh, okay, well, uh, I guess I can bring my friend into audition, but it's kind of nepotistic. And so we brought her in, and she just blew us all away. And we were like, oh, gosh, we have to use her. So that's Go, what, Kipley! Yeah. Go, Kipley! <laughs> I think I meant when I read the script, might have been after I, um, when I got the audition, I got the script, and then I wanted to eat it. But yeah, that's cool. Like, it's another kismet thing that my agent saw that project. It's like, let's, let's see if they all want to you know, pick up Kipley Brown for an audition. Yeah. Well, it, it, it truly worked out. And, and now, had you, let me think about this. You had already done Enterprise by that point. Yes. So, um, now, again, another one of my, for somebody who got to play a, a, a pivotal role in a, in, now, mind you, I'm, I'm going to let you know now, and James is one of the few people who knows this, but uh, Enterprise is my second favorite Star Trek uh, show. I watched 16 hours in a, in a row of Enterprise this weekend. You're a wise man. <laughs> That's a wonderful way to celebrate our nation's birth. And then my <laughs> and, um, but it really is one of the most beautiful roles that is played because you're kind of played as a memory. Your character is, is, mm-hmm. is played as this amazing kind of memory or, or thought. What would you call yourself? Well, it's kind of left ghost? up. Ghost. It's left up to the to the audience member. I, technically, he wakes up from a dream, but you know, a presence in the dream or his psyche or his consciousness, um, you know, it could be a number of different things. You know, depending on one's interpretation. Um, and I like to say, and I'm, I know that that there are you know, type people out there that will uh, tell me that I'm probably extremely wrong. But I like to pretend, for as long as I can anyway, that I'm the only red shirt to seek after death. Mm-hmm. Now, sir, technically speaking, because I, you know, wasn't... I think I'm not red shirt. correct because Eddie Pascal died in Obsession, but he was back later. But I don't think he spoke after that, so I think she's right. And I had a red, you know, I, was, I, I had a red stripe on my uniform, so I was technically a red stripe. Although I was not security, and I know some people... By all definitions, you were a red shirt because yeah. you died on an away mission, and you were kind of like... The, she did you not... Know, you were nameless until... No, well, no she, she did not die on an away mission. She didn't die on an away She She died under his command. She yeah. tries to decompress the deck that she was in. I was engineering, but I think that red shirts can also die on the ship as long as... It's all like, right. Hey, I agree. No, you know, I just it's like insta death. It, whoever gets insta death. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I'm just saying. I agree. Uh, well, I think this. You had a zombie <laughs> moment in that episode too, right? Say that again. There, you had a zombie moment in that episode where you were all, you know, makeup up. <laughs> um, zombie moment. That would have been awesome. Um, <laughs> it was directed by. Le- oh, you guys. Yeah, it was directed by Levar Burton. And when I did makeup for that, he, they kept sending me down, and he'd, um, and he'd look at the makeup and he'd say, "Yeah, you know what? Rough her up ten percent more. You know, it's <laughs> like the right amount of, of sort of roughed up, not pristine and perfect, but like I just." woken up from the accident. You know what I call those the kind of instructions in this house? Mm-hmm. Friday night. Sorry. Friday night. Uh, yeah. but I'm, I'm, yeah, it was bad. Well, um, I, you about, uh, I don't think I, I tell this story all the time, so sorry for anyone who's heard it, but about how I got that part, how I auditioned. No, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm what brought it up was how did you get involved in a Star Trek production? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
Um, well, I, I got that through my agent, and I'm already, I was already a, a huge Star Trek fan. Um, and my numero uno is The Next Generation. Good woman. Um, Good woman. Oh, yeah. Love it. Uh, and I got the audition. I was like, oh, cool. Oh, my God. It would be amazing to be in, in, in a Star Trek manifestation of some sort. And uh, so I auditioned, and um, I got called back. And usually there's a series of, like, three or four auditions before you get a role that has, like, that much speaking in it. So I was expecting there'd be some, some more rounds of elimination. And the second time I went in, oh, and by the way, I had to pretend like I did not know much about Star Trek because they sometimes don't like to cast mega fans because things yeah. disappear from the set. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of, you know, so it's yeah. like Star Trek. What's that? I don't know what that is. Star Trek. Anyway, let me audition for you. Um, so I was like playing down how awesome <laughs> Star Trek is. So I was, you know, going in the next time being all Star Trek. What's that? And I walk in the room, and the director's in the room, and no one told me who was directing it. So I walk in all cool at the ice, and I look, and the Lord Burton is sitting right there. No warning. <laughs> You're the guy from Reading Rainbow. <laughs> freak out and wet myself right back in there. I should get an Oscar for not freaking out as much as I was inside. That was such a moment, like, oh. And then when I got it, I, I, I'm pretty sure yeah. the neighborhood was aware when I got it. They probably thought there was a crime happening because of the screaming, but, um, yeah. So excited. I bet. I, My I, only regret I, is that it, obviously she couldn't be reoccurring. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She did die right off the bat. Thank Sorry. You. I guess because maybe, well, but I didn't think that was going to happen. Well, Taylor was awesome, and I loved her character, and I, and if anything, I think she did a really good job of helping Trip grow a little as a human being. I'm just saying. And humanizing. Yeah, yeah. She and did a good job. And for his sister. <laughs> it was very good. It was um, by far one of my, my, my favorite episodes. It really was. Just because, well, Again, I was a big fan, and I loved it. Well, Kipley, I, I'm going to mention some names, and when I get done, please tell us what you have in common with them, okay? Okay. Joan Rivers. Um, uh, David Steinberg. I've got a few names. Da oh. David Steinberg, the great Peter Boyle, Brian Doyle Murray, <laughs> John Belushi, Bill Murray, Tim Kazarinski, Steve Carell, Tina Fey. What is it you have in common with them? You want me to remember all those names in order? Well, I'll start with Joan. No, Rivers. no, no, no. You all went to the. You have all one thing in common. The, one thing in common, correct? Oh, oh. I thought this was a fun, like, jokey question. I was going to say extensive plastic surgery for a. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just being uh, outshadowed by my, my sibling for Brian Doyle Murphy. Um, what is Improv Olympic? Second, Second City? City, yeah. Yeah, Second yeah I did City. both, and a lot of them did too. Yeah. yeah. What was that like, Second City? Because that's such a such a huge name. I mean, it's Harold Ramis, you know, but uh, the, the people that have come out of there, what, what did that teach you? Oh, it's amazing, because I, I did Second City in Chicago where it originated, hence the name, because, you know, Chicago was always second to New York. To New York, right. Uh, or to L.A. As it should be. Now, L.A. doesn't care, so it would have totally been that. Uh, right. <laughs> well, yeah. For, for okay, New York was New York long before L.A. was L.A. So let's and not. that's why okay. L.A. I doesn't mean, care. I didn't want to hurt L.A.'s feelings, so I threw it in there, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was amazing because a lot of the um, people that taught my classes were already legends. No one that you just mentioned, and no one who was a performer. They they mostly started off as writers and directors. Um, but a lot of them aren't around anymore. Like you know, so it's amazing that I got to work with you know Marty Demott and um, just a whole just legendary names that taught so many generations of uh, people improv and sort of the spontaneous acting. Now and it and you also were at Steppenwolf. For I did a, a training program there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that, that's it, great too. It was it. I was going to say that experience must have been something because I know that um, it it has a name for a reason. These places have a name for a reason. <laughs> yes, they do. And Steppen, it, it's funny because they were the. Um, like diametric opposite because Steppenwolf is you know, so serious really dramatic they do comedies too but it's like you know it's one is like only really comedy and kind of like sketch comedy improv comedy tends to be sort of you know not not a long deep story <laughs> right and Steppenwolf tells stories and um, so I got the yin and the yang in, in Chicago which is my I think it's the best theater town I really do um, just because it has 
it has the you know the Broadway style shows, but it also has like the, the hidden gems and uh, it was just it's the best place to train. And I didn't plan on on necessarily training, you know, just by doing. Um, I was supposed to go to college, and you know, at the last minute, bad things happened, and I couldn't go. Yeah. And it turns out that the thing I loved, it, I was served better just going out there at 18 and then auditioning and doing stuff. It's the best Interesting. learning and the best teaching. And the Now, my next question is going to be for both of you, and that is, you knew each other from before. How did you guys meet? Well, Chicago is partially responsible, I would say. Yeah. Um, a lot of people I know from Chicago moved out here before I did. Um, and they had a long-standing, there used to be a bar called Michael's Room in Los Feliz, and mm-hmm. had a long-standing family night, it was called. And it started just Chicago people meeting up Thursday nights. And then it, you know, extended to people from Texas and St. Louis and various places that, you know, friends of friends and friends. It was just sort of a, a, a fun hangout of people that know each other. And so I was at family night, and then there was James, and I, you came because of Catherine O'Connor, is that mm-hmm. Yeah. So a mutual friend of ours yeah. invited James, and that's how we met. And he was telling me about some of his projects, and and uh, I saw uh, the, the um, you, I saw a videotaped Venus version Adonis, of yeah. Venus and Adonis, which was actually a stage play. Like obviously it had ended by then, but and was so impressed. And I was like, this is someone who, who knows like like knows story. I mean, and knows how to um, bring things to life off the page, and it's really exciting. Oh, that's great. Now, um, let's... <laughs> I'm all excited because it's just like you guys talk character, you guys talk story, you talk about the creative process. It is... Um, uh, to kind you're of, our dream. Yeah, you're totally <laughs> our dream. I'm like, yay! Um, when it comes to Star Trek, we all kind of are always amazed at the fact that Star Trek has had the longevity that it has had, namely because, um, yeah, you can throw away production quality over the uh, over decades because we all know that, you know, TOS just doesn't have that shiny stuff that it could have had if it was made now. But the reason why it survived is because of story and character. What is it about Star Trek, in your own opinion, about those characters and why they have the longevity? That they do, even in a character like Jane Taylor, why is she going to survive um, through the decades? Because yeah. she was. Oh, go on. Sorry. Um, go for it. Well, I'll get to Jane Taylor. I'll, I'll start with the, the original series. I mean, and this is not necessarily an original thought, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, at that time in the in the '60s, there was a lot of apocalyptic gloom and doom hanging over everyone. And the idea of you know danger and, and all the all, everyone at that time was predicting a horrible future. Like all the sci-fi writers, most of it was like the dystopian futures. And, and G. Roddenberry came out and said, "No, wait a minute. Here's a future where we don't blow ourselves up. And look, there's a Russian on the bridge next to a black woman, next to someone from uh, I can't go. Uh, where was Kirk from originally? Iowa. Iowa. Yeah. That's and then there's a lot of racism yeah. then for people from Iowa. So this was you know. <laughs> Um, you know, and so like that, I think for me anyway, I was too young to really be aware of all that stuff. I actually wasn't, I saw it in reruns. Um, but like to have this vision of hope and that the sci-fi stuff wasn't just an excuse to have guns and shooting and que- like weird monsters. It was the story. It was the character. Yeah. 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 And so Jane Taylor, I think will, will stand out because there were few times in the original episode where auxiliary people who were knocked off were like properly mourned and of course they can't stop and do that for every you know show it's not but so maybe maybe jane taylor represents all the red shirts that thank you got the proper eulogy you know and so thank you yeah yeah it's so true it's so true okay (laughs) it's true Uh for all of the complaints that i hear about the red shirts never got properly more unless you're janeway then only about six people matter and they're the only ones you're going to go back in time for (laughs) this was this was also third season towards the latter half wasn't it um so at at this point they probably already had an idea that they were on the track to to cancellation so it could have also been a a eulogy of sorts for star trek yeah because it was in the zindy arc oh mike's getting all deep and shit now. 
Oh, wow. I'm that's always deep in shit. <laughs> Actually, no, that was, that was my main line. You know, I <laughs> that, no, Star Trek's never going to have that problem. No. It will never no. be forgotten, and that was the name of the episode I was in, The Forgotten. Um, I wonder if I had anything to do with it being canceled. Uh-huh. I doubt oh, it. I no, because it lasted another uh, season. <laughs> you probably saved it for it's another season. It's not like you're Ted McGinley. <laughs> what was that? It's not like she's Ted McGinley. Oh, oh wow. Oh, don't even, so like no, don't even act like it. No, I'm not. Don't even act like that. Why not? Shows. I'm laughing because I'm like, oh, dude, that was your ship's fucking photographer. Please. <laughs> I'm like, you just aged me. Is what that was. I know. Wow, oh, jeez. Notice so, the total crickets from the other side on that on a Ted yeah. McGinley reference. Well, I, I, I was going to pretend She's I young. Know who that is? Uh, I, I, we, I, we don't know who that is. I'm sorry. Okay, so can yeah. you watch Happy Days? <laughs> yes. yes. When everybody left and he came in and he was the gym teacher, the blonde guy. The blonde oh, guy. I knew the new. I knew like when when Ron Howard left, they had some poor guy that had to play that. That was kind of it. And then when Love Boat, when Julie got kicked off the series because she was a coke addict. They brought in your ship's photographer, Ted McGinley. Oh my gosh, so he's, he's like the, the um yeah, he's the portal. Yeah, he's the yeah. back to Flair. Replacing he also Patrick. played Marcy's uh, husband, <laughs> late in Married with Children. I, yeah, I never that's realized right. that. I have my Ted McGinley facts down. Wow. Man, okay, I, I can't compete with that. James, James <laughs> he frightens me at, at, at weekly. Weekly, he frightens me. Sure I can't remember what I have to do for my job. I probably had an advantage because, you know, I could have played Julie better being a woman. Yeah, Why was she like a cute young thing with a dude? Yeah. Well, because it was ABC and, and they were not, yeah. No, see, but the sad thing is, I can't remember what I have to do in my job, but yet I can tell you Ted McGinley's bio. So. <laughs> <laughs> Does, is Ted McGinley still um, on this mortal place? He uh-huh. is. Yeah. He is. He's killing series still, as far as I know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So he killed Happy Days. It wasn't the jumping over the sharks. It was he. I think it was the jumping over no, the sharks. No, because Ricky was still on when they jumped the shark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. So, the, Nick, uh, Nick, do you have, do you have the my questions that we're going to bastardize? I do. Oh, okay, actually, good. you know, Ted McGinley, I'm looking it up. He was on an episode of Mad Men. Oh, so far. oh he was? Oh, great. So now yeah. can't, that show's not coming back now, probably. <laughs> totally not coming back. Coming back. They're, they're planning on canceling it or ending this the show soon. Anyway, Terry, so. yeah, okay. they can take, they can afford to bring him on. I'm about to make Terry cry. Uh-oh. He voiced Aquaman too in Batman: The Brave and the Bold. Yeah, yeah, he voiced Aquaman. Take take your pseudo superhero. He's not a superhero. He's a guy that lives in the water, Terry. Oh, just saying, the water. He he's controls because yes, controls he purposes to pleasure him. That's what he does. Oh. He's like the, he's like the Tarzan of the sea. This this is the point in time when a, a set needs a director to kind of keep people on track. I love you, James. With a megaphone and say, all right, <laughs> it up. These are our James Lipton questions. <laughs> but I also have some other ones that I'm going to throw in as well. Right. Okay. We're going to Terry- we're going to twist these because we created these for, to, our, for our authors that we interview. A lot we we interview a lot of novel writers, and so we created these pretty much for the novel writers. But we twist them based on the careers of the people that we do interview. So um, we're going to twist these a lot. I'm afraid. Of First, <laughs> easy question: What's your favorite Trek series? I already answered it, so James. Did. Um, I would have to say. It is a very close time between DS9 and the original series. Um, if you had asked me that six months ago, I would have said DS9, but I've been re-watching the original series lately, and I it's starting to maybe pass DS9 a little bit. Wow. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I had not watched the original series since I was quite young, actually, early teens, and um, I'm rediscovering it and being like, oh my god, this is way more complex than I thought it was. All right, so I'm going to ask you a second question along those lines. No, no No secondary questions. (laughs) (laughs) Coming out of there. Great. You've you've angered their Fuhrer. Nice. I was going to say he got all he got all Colonel Clink on me. I'm liking that. (laughs) No secondary questions. Um, Actually, that would be General Hofstadter. It would have been, wouldn't it? It would have been General Ho- Oh, my God, I can't believe that. That was the soup Nazi, wasn't it? No. no. General Hofstadter was the SS. Sh- Shut up. Oh, Michael, you're too young. We need well, to sit I'm him down and make him watch that, that your was the reference. I, that, that's what I got from it. It was the soup Thank Nazi. You. I was doing a Larry <laughs> Thomas impression there. So. Oh. Anyway, go on. Oh, so, the, no, this, now can I remember what the secondary question was? Okay, you talked about this. Okay, the, so, do you believe that, that how you're dealing with your uh, the rekindling of your affection for TOS. Do you think that's why we're seeing such an uh, an influx of new fans 
that are new fans because of the original series and not any of the later series. Well, Do you think- I, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the, the reality is, is that Next Gen and DS9, as much as I love them, they are already fairly dated. If you watch them, they were shot in a way and cut in a way, and even the visual effects were done in a way that is very 90s. And, uh, and and again, I'm not. What do you think about my my, my main I'm man? I'm not insulting. I'm not, I'm not the insulting. Because TOS them at all. is so up to date. No, but the, <laughs> the difference is, is that TOS was shot in a way that, while it is a reflection of the late '60s, I would argue that TOS is less a reflection of the late '60s stylistically than Next Gen and DS9 were of the '90s, because TOS broke all the rules of how you shoot a television series back then. Uh, I mean, literally, like, all the rules. And I think that's one of the reasons that it holds up so well right now. So so tell us, what were the differences? How did the shooting of uh, TOS differ from its counterparts in the same uh, era? I mean, every... Well, uh, you know, it, it, it just... They're, they're, they're de- the way that they dealt with models, the way that they dealt yeah. with opticals, True. the way that they lit it was completely unconventional yeah. for the late right. 60s. Um, you know, they had this guy who was fairly inexperienced, um, but it created this own kind of, like, really chiaroscuro style because he really didn't know that much about what he was doing. And you also had great writers like David Gerald, like Harlan Ellison, people like this, like DC Fontana, coming in and writing episodes for it. Um, so you have these incredible themes that, um, that, that, that and, and again, you have to think about the fact that TOS was done, and this is something we struggle with in Star Trek Continues, TOS was done before the universe of Star Trek was created, before all the political rules and all the different races and everything that the later series established. So it was very much about telling stories that had never been told before, mysteries, stories that you're like, when you watch the first two acts, you're like, I have no idea how this story is going to get resolved. And that's something we're trying to recapture in Star Trek Continues. May I no, just James. a shout out for the next generation, though, here? And, and yeah. uh-huh. Only, if, only well, if it's not for the first two seasons. <laughs> no. Well, you know what? Season two has Measure of a Man. Sure. Uh, and yeah. it does have Dr. Pulaski, who Terry and I were big fans of Dr. Pulaski. Huge, well, huge no, Pulaski yeah. fans. But I gotta say, mo- yeah, season one's a wash. Season two, most of it's a wash. Um, but some of the most heady, beautiful concepts, and they're like, like, like sentience of data and what is life and this and that. Anyway, I was gonna. He's, James is totally shaking his head right now. Measure of <laughs> make a Requiem for Methuselah. It was. I mean, they dealt with those concepts. They did it better in the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit back and let them go. Let, let them go. That was right. but, but I was going to say, you said that it wasn't necessarily a reflection of the 90s and the 80s because it's during the 80s. Uh, did you see some of the outfits they were wearing? Yeah. I do think that you can definitely look at Next Generation and get a feel for the era, but if you're talking about only stylistically and how they shot, then... No, I mean, I all, I mean all that. The, the wardrobe, everything. And, 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 of course, TOS is a product of the late 60s. But I think there's something about that that makes people, that rekindles in people this concept of hope for the future at the same time of... There's there's dread for the potential wrongdoings of what could happen in the future. I, it, it just it, it, look. I'm not saying that TOS was better than DS9. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm I'm really torn between the two. I love Next Gen also. I really do. I'm not. I mean, it's so there, choice, there's, you guys. There's, it's not a fair question. There's only so one thing that I strongly dislike, and I'm not going to say it on the air. But um, Boy, yeah, you're, I'm not saying. It. I've I said it many times. times. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you know, why? Because and we've discussed. It, Voyager was so inconsistent in the writing of the characters. One episode, Janeway would be the kind of officer that me, as a as, as 25 years in the Army, I would follow Janeway in a second. And then for three episodes in a row, she's totally inconsistent with that. Poor Harry spent seven years as an ensign. He gets in trouble for getting laid when everybody else got laid. Don't even get me started. I can't even. Yeah, I, I, and, and it's interesting you bring that up because at Track Vegas, this year, I believe it's on Friday, there is a Captain's in Charge panel in which each uh-huh. of us represents, as a lawyer, a captain in like a trial. And Kipley is representing Picard and I'm representing Cisco. Right. So, yeah. And there's a there's a 
Kirk and a Janeway and a uh, an lot. Archer also. Yeah. And an but Archer when you, too, so. I would argue because DS9 is my favorite, partially because so many of the secondary and even some third level characters had deeper backstories than a lot of main characters on other shows. Yeah. But, but I would argue that that show, now Toss set the stage, without a doubt, it set everything in motion. But DS9 altered everything with the, the, the continuing arcs, like Enterprise Dead with Season 3 with the Zindi arc. Yeah. And, and things like that, where Enterprise was the first Trek to do that, where where 10 weeks ago had ramifications on this Yeah, week. yeah. Well, DS9 was, I did that, yeah. I, I mean, DS9 was very forward thinking. I mean, it was Ron Moore, you know? I mean, it was Ira Bear. It was these guys who went on to do very modern shows like, like Battlestar Galactica. Which know? I was going to say earlier, Kipley, mm-hmm. uh, you would be my Starbuck any day. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I've only just started watching Battlestar Galactica. Oh, I'm going to love it. Those character hoil a little bit, and the character I, I do in RUR to Starbuck, I'm like, I better check out this Starbuck and make sure that this is a compliment. And I'm like, so honored. She's right so badass. Right on. Now, James, have you read These Are the Voyages by Mark Cushman, uh, season one and season two? Have you heard about this? Uh, I, I know Mark, Mark is our story editor on right. continues. Yeah. Wonderful, man. Mark has written, uh, he, he received 80 boxes of memos and everything from Gene Roddenberry. I know. So oh, yeah. Write the, and yeah, so <laughs> the things we're talking about with how it changed, um, you know, because one of Gene Roddenberry's thing, big things was, I don't want Lost in Space for my show. The whole key. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Mark says, and, and he's right about this, is that no show today goes through through the laborious process of developing each and every script that Star Trek, the original series, did back in the late 60s. I mean, the, the, the memos back and forth and the writing and the rewriting and the pouring over every little detail of, would Spock do this? Would Kirk do this? Would it, you know, it was, it was intense if you read those books. I mean, you just see how much thought went into those shows. Yeah. Pretty now, amazing. I, I, if, if you don't want to answer this, just, just whistle or something, what do either of you think of the JJ universe? Um, you know, I I think of it as, as, as separate. I, I do. I have to because it is so so different. It's, it's the modern day. You know, I think it was smart of him to make an alternate universe because I wouldn't want to see anything from the original bastardized in any way. And neither would you know. We are such devoted fans. Um, you know, I see the movies and they're good, and I'm like, yeah, that was really exciting sci-fi movie. And, and but it, they don't to me have the heart of Trek. And maybe they will develop it, but it's not the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I like them. I mean, I think they are they are what um, they're what needed to happen at that point in time um, to to reinvigorate the franchise in in the modern generation's mind. Uh, tell these stories in the way in a very modern way. And I agree with Kipley that it's, I'm, I'm glad he spun it off into an alternate timeline and said I'm not interfering with the prime timeline at all. This is an alternate thing, and here's the way I'm doing it. I, I have no problem with that. Uh, there's room for both. Yeah. And- and it's also like a recruiting thing. It's recruiting new, new yeah. fresh. You know, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, the show, I mean, you know, if you look at the last, you know, I actually rewatched Nemesis last night. Oh. Uh, and um, and I also watched the 45 minutes of deleted scenes on the Blu-ray. Yep. And it is. Amazing. And you wept. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing what that film could have been. Oh, it's um, so it's so heartbreaking. <laughs> it, it is. It really is because that was an epic story about these characters, about the character of Picard dealing with the loss of his friends, about the character of Data. Of I mean, it was it's it, th- those deleted scenes. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You cut that, but you put in a half an hour of Shins on and the Remans pressing buttons on their ship. Are you what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was a great script, and it would have been Mike, a great film. I was chuckling because he knows. My my, my absolute hatred of what happened because you know Star Trek 3 it wasn't supposed to be the Klingons it was supposed to be the Romulans but no once again the Romulans got bent over and <laughs> given the old bat lift up the old hoop shoot and then they got it in Nemesis <laughs> We deal with this on a weekly basis. Wow. Poor, poor, poor Romulan. I know. Thank yes. you. Yes. 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 To me, that, I mean, right there. Bajorans were asking for it. If they had just done what the Cardassians oh. asked, everything uh. would have been fine. 
I mean, whatever whatever decision was made on the studio level to cut 45 minutes out of Nemesis and turn it into the thing that it is, yeah. that killed Star Trek. It really did. I agree. For, 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 I for almost a decade. Um, I agree. That would have been a phenomenal film if they had a lot of that material. You know, and, and as, a, as, a, as a person who said that their number one is the next generation, did not like the movies. Not yeah. even First Contact, which I know everyone else like gets, you know, you know, oh, crazy over. No, I thought they, they molested the characters in those. Like, they turned the card into something like oh rip my shirt off and run around you know and it's like it just yeah I didn't I didn't care for the movies because they they completely departed from the characters that we loved like, Data gets an emotion ship and becomes like a clown you know it's like come on I, I think it also I mean Nemesis since we're talking about Nemesis I think it hurt oh you know like you said it hurt Star Trek but it, I, I think the ramifications of that were even felt in in the novel universe as well um, I don't I don't think it was until David Mack wrote the Destiny series that things actually started on a road to recovery to recon- recorrected the course yeah very possible. Now, Nick, what's the next question? Okay, if if either, if both of you, let's say you're cast in a movie or an episode of a new Star Trek series or movie, you can be any species other than human. What species would you be? I know, but I don't want to take. Do you want to go first? I would like to be a Vulcan. The reason I say that is because I take umbrage with the way a lot of people in the modern era play Vulcans. Uh-huh. A lot of people see them being emotionless, but they play them robotically. And I'm That's not Vulcan. That because they're, if you look at Leonard Nimoy, and I'm not saying you have to copy Leonard Nimoy to play a Vulcan, but they do have emotions, they suppress them, and you can, you can show that, you can act that, versus I will just say everything very clearly like this and not you know, make facial expressions. And there is so much that can come out in what you don't say that no one grabs a hold of. So you were getting we're, the 80s slow clap. We are. You're getting yes. the 80s slow yes. clap. I'm like, yeah. Now, I I'm, I just have one thing to ask Nick Very right true. now over, over you, so I apologize, Kipley, but um, Nick? Yes? Could you, I'm just I'm just asking, with with a darker wig, do you think Kipley, you know, to, without to prank? Doubt, without yeah. 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 Oh, to prank? Yes. Guy, I'm just yeah. saying, to prank, she could do it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm out. <laughs> well, I, now, I love Tim Ross as Tuvok. I, I really did. But it took me several seasons to warm up with that. I thought by season three, T'Pol was being played correctly in in Enterprise. Yeah, they, they, but I, it I, took I, a drug addiction yeah. for the character to do that. Well, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Spock was half, <laughs> yeah. Spock was half human. Yeah. Right. So you have, you more, have to be boring when you're a Vulcan. I didn't say you do, but Spock did have more emotions than most Vulcans. True. Yeah. You have to acknowledge. That. But even when they, there were more to the about, surface because he had breaks, right? He had breaks of emotion. But in in the original series, when he is completely Vulcan, he would have little expressions or, or, or like a slightly sarcastic tone. Yeah, now twinkle in his eye. Right. But yeah, now but people he, just play them like they are the most boring person on earth who is very intelligent and basically just a biological computer. And it's like, nah. See, Spock was doing the raised eyebrow before Vulcans the be rock. Vulcans grinding their teeth the, more often than... <laughs> the, the rock got the raised eyebrow from Spock. Let's just call it spade a spade on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're so true. similar. Well, and it's something that we hear time and time again is that Vulcans aren't emotionless. They just have a very unique talent at being able to suppress those emotions. Which and is one of the interesting that's things. That's got to take my, a lot of work. With the 16-hour Enterprise Marathon last weekend, one of the interesting things was how many times Trip or Archer said, you, you, you have emotions, you just suppress them, you're not emotional. How many times they said that, which I thought was really, that I had never really caught until I did kind of that mini marathon, that that was raised quite a few times in yeah, season one of Enterprise. Because they had to remind the audience. Right. right because so, I love yeah. Gary Graham as, as the ambassador. I thought he was really good. Uh, there's, and talk about a pretentious character. All right. Gary Graham or Saval? Saval. Oh, okay. I was going to say, don't pick on Gary Graham. It's about, about what, what species you would be. I want to hear that, guys. It's going to be good. It's going to be obscure. Be I would say... James? I would, I would say either a delphin. Oh. You'd shave your head? Well, I wouldn't have to because we, we have no hair if we're delphins. Right. Um, yeah, or, we do. Or um, <laughs> we'd say a Oh, okay. You know, that is so you. I... 
you know, we have somebody that we know that we, <laughs> that is so you. That, I was just like, that's that such the, a Jane's answer. We we know huh? somebody who says the Bajorans are a two dimensional species. There was no depth to them, and I just looked at him and said, "What are you? I, what kind yeah, of I drugs are you taking?" I love them. Nick Minetti. That wasn't me. <laughs> I stuck up for the Bajorans. <laughs> it wasn't me. Had. Oh yeah. Well, he's look where he's at. Right? Is he here? Okay. James, what's the here? next question? Yes. Okay. Uh, da, 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 okay. Wow. Yo, boy. I love James. Uh, yes. Sir. What's the name of your starship? The USS Titanic. <laughs> you almost gotta give that a good name again. I'll be the one. All right. <laughs> again, James has the look of intense concentration on his face. Hypatia. <gasps> Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. I want a starship named after a female scientist from the ancient world. Yeah, that's cool. I have a Hypatia in the game, so that's good. Yeah, I approve. You're such a Next. suck up times. I am. I am a total suck up. When are you going to learn this? Okay. We play a game called Life Pod 1. I'm going to throw one at them. I'm going to awesome. throw my Life Pod 1. Okay. You're the pilot. There's only four remaining seats. So of these five characters, you have to leave one behind. You can't say you're staying behind. You have to choose one. So on your ship are Kirk, Picard, Archer, Janeway, and Cisco. Who are you leaving behind and why? Are you kidding? It's not even a question. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a question, my friend. It's a real question. See, I have a problem that the, that the person that I would leave behind is also the only female. Yeah. It sounds like it might be. <laughs> I think we, no, it's right. all the captains. I mean, <laughs> the most incompetent captain there is. Oh, I didn't say that. Um, yeah. Just did. So it's Janeway for both of you, huh? I feel bad, like kicking the only other lady. The, the reason I the reason I dislike Janeway so much, and we'll get into this at the Vegas thing, is that I feel like they had the opportunity to show a female in a powerful role, the way they did with Kira in Deep Space Nine. But rather than go the direction of Kira in Deep Space Nine, they made Janeway all emotional, and like she would get into these moods, and she would make stupid decisions because she was in moods. And I think it, it demeaned women in a way that that yeah. would not have happened if they had played her as a stronger character. That's, uh, and right. I, it's not impugning the acting skill. No. But, you know, it, it, it's how no, she was No, it's just written. like you said. She was, she was written. written. Very inconsistent. Right. I, I think all of us occur, or concur with that. Now, I, I'm, I'm twisting this one from how we usually ask it. What film director's movies do you, quote, run out to, like, the weekend they're released that you and can't wait And for Kipling, is there a particular actor or actress films that the moment that they come out you feel like you need to go see? Um, well, in terms of director Stanley Kubrick, not that he's having you know, a lot of <laughs> new stuff <laughs> yeah. coming out. Say, is he like Tupac? Is he really alive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that in terms of modern directors, um, well, I think the, the, you know, Caruth, is it Sean Caruth? Shane Caruth. Shane Caruth, who, who did Primer, and then I recently saw a second one of his oh, called Color. Uh, Skin Color, which is very unusual. Um, but like you were saying earlier, you guys, like how there's not a lot of original ideas in Hollywood. This guy has original ideas, and they have some, sort of a sci-fi bent to it. You know that you're, you know, they'll be intelligent. And also a guy named James Kerwin. I see him just about anything he did. <laughs> no bias. <laughs> <No. laughs> Nice move. What about actors or actresses that you feel like you need to see every one of their performances? Well, you know, it's sad because I would have at one time told you Liam Neeson, but he's mm. gone to the dark side and he just does like action now. Not, not to say an actor can't do that, but he's just become oh, like yeah. kind of like blockbuster shoot 'em up guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, miss, I miss some of the more nuanced acting and also Kate Blanchett. I love her. Yeah, she's amazing. James, oh, British actress. Uh, well, Kubrick is my favorite director. I would say Hitchcock is up there. Um, uh, as far as living directors, I would say Scorsese, uh, Ridley Scott. Um, yeah. I see everything he does. Um, I still think Black Rain is one of the most underrated films. Love that movie. There you go. Um, I love Shane Kruth also. Um, and uh, uh, Darren Aronofsky. Oh, oh, yeah. What did you think of The Wrestler? I didn't see... I have not seen The Wrestler. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Neither of you said Christopher Nolan, which kind of hurts me because he's never done anything I, I less than loved. Oh, well, that's you. I could attribute that <laughs> to, the, to the that I'm not as big of a comic book superhero type of. of no, but before that he had uh, the Memento and Memento and, uh, and Inception. Yeah. yeah. In, yeah. Insomnia. Yeah. Oh well, then yeah, those movies I really like a lot. I'm sorry, Christopher. <laughs> I underestimated you, pal. Oh my God, cast me your movies. I'll make it up to you. Shameless Kipley Brown. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> 
Oh, welcome to my world, sweetheart. <laughs> I'll take right. Now, what I, I'm going to take the next question. I know it's a twist on one that we kind of now. Is there a and the beauty is is that you could say this either if it's for stage or film. It doesn't matter for either of you. If you had the choice of of uh, James for directing and or writing and and Kipley for writing or acting or whatever role that you want, is there a particular project that you would love to be able to be? You know, is there to say a specific role that you would just love to be able to play that and and or um, maybe a play or or even a, a project that you would like to bring to the film. Either one of you. A specific role that exists already, or like yeah, that already that exists. Role. I mean, I mean, I, I I noticed that I know you've done a lot of stage, and I know that James, you've also been involved in stage work as well. So I'm assuming that you both are very big fans of. I mean, let's face it, everybody's a big fan uh, for the most part of of Shakespeare. Is and it doesn't have to be a Shakespeare role. Is there a role that you've seen? on stage or in a film or and somebody says oh my god we're going to do a reboot or something that you say oh my god I would I would die to play this role or I would die to direct the remake of this film you wanna go? I, I feel like I'm taking off James's time but he has expensive looks oh no I, I was I was thinking um uh, uh, well, obviously, I would say R.U.R. I love R.U.R. And, and we have R.U.R. in development right now, and that's something that I've always wanted to direct for 20 years now. Um, and I really hope uh, that, that it gets greenlit and we're able to take that off as a project. Um, another dream project of mine would be to direct Antony and Cleopatra. Um, huh? I love, it's my favorite Shakespeare play. Um, it, I, I, it, is, it is not often done because it's epic and understated at the same time. Um, and it deals with uh, a, a critically important uh, war in history that really changed the course of the entire world. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with ancient Egyptian culture, and I would just love to tell that story. So that would kind of be like a cool thing I'd like to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm a- my, there's a lot of stage plays that I would kill to be, and I couldn't even, like, mention all of them because, gosh, you know, I mean, um, but there is something that I, I, I've always wanted to play a female villain, but not, like, one-dimensional comic book <laughs> villain, like a really deep, nefarious, complex villain that you almost sympathize with. I've always wanted to see that role, and they've done it. They've done it. I just haven't seen it in... Uh, a female role. But usually, like, female villains, they gotta be sexy and be very, very little and blah, blah, blah. Right. Not saying that this, you know, person would have necessarily, you know, I understand a system. Um, but just the type of villain that, that you can identify with. I, don't, I haven't seen Maleficent. I don't even know. Yeah, it. I haven't either. Yeah. I don't know if, if Angelique, she strikes me as the kind of actress that would like to add complexity to a typical villain. I haven't seen it. Um, but just something like that, that, that's not all black and white. And something you could totally chew on. Yeah, yeah. Not just evil for the sake of being evil. Something more like, I think if you go back to the 30s or 40s, you could find something something in there with the, the femme fatales from back back then. Or even more devious. There's yeah. some great devious that's, roles back then. That's just it. The femme fatale. It's, uh, it's, it's, I don't mind the femme fatale. No, but they were way like more the devious. woman has to use her sexuality to be evil. Right. I think there's other ways. You know, it's always like the evil, you know, seductress. And I want to see a, a different kind of female villain that has that part to her, sure. But that's not all it is. It's the conniving behind the scenes seductress who maneuvers power around with her with her breasts, you know, kind of stuff. <laughs> that's I like her. <laughs> I do. Nick, you got another question? I do. Do you have... Now, we asked this of the the writers, but I'm going to ask you guys because I really want to hear your reactions. Do you have a favorite adjective? Do you overuse it? And is there an adjective you loathe? (laughs) I loathe uh, the adjective um, moist. (laughs) But that's a word that sounds dirty, but it's not. I just don't like... If you're you're like, oh, try the oatmeal, it's moist. I'm going to not try it. I find it a very unpleasant word. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I have one I like, but I, I'll tell you one I hate, which is amazing. <laughs> and everyone in every interview says, oh, he is amazing. Oh, that <laughs> is amazing. Oh, oh God. <laughs> I'm sorry, James. It started in the 80s, hear? and I have yet That's to be amazing. able to shake it. Really? <laughs> what? So amazing. It yeah, started oh. in the 80s in Reseda. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> 
I think uncular is a really good adjective. Uh. <laughs> Oprah <laughs> like an uncle, uncle-y. Nauseous is good. Oh, that's a good one. Spelled well. Spelled well. <laughs> <laughs> it translates into a noun very well. Nausea. Yeah. It's very pretty. <laughs> Which is ironic, really, if you think about it. Oh, no, because sometimes it can be very pretty. Yeah. Some of the ugliest things are the prettiest. I mean, okay, this is where I'm showing my true colors here, guys. But if you just listen to the sound of it, purely the sound of it, not what it means, the word diarrhea. <laughs> Very pretty. <laughs> it's got that H right there in the middle. It's like yeah. a very, a very with a diarrhea. It's a very like flowy word. God. Pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> just such a shame it was assigned to such a nasty thing. <laughs> I love this. This is hilarious. <laughs> I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, N- Michael, are you okay? You're still doing all right, hon? <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm just dealing with a few other things here. Oh, okay. Uh, so funny. He's doing producer things. He's doing producer things. He's probably going, all right, how am I going to do this? <laughs> uh, next. Okay, okay, now this is something because something just came across my news feed. Are either of you Neil Gaiman fans? Oh, I knew it would come into play at some point. Don't pick on my man crush. Okay. I Are either of you... Yes, but my brother-in-law tells me I must. Yeah, I, I, I honestly know I'm not... Uh, okay, sorry. Sorry, I was totally <laughs> with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's okay. Oh. You just Inflated his balloon. Yeah. No, all right. You should read the first thing you read by him. Should be Neverwhere. I can't recommend that. I'm not. I don't know. I like the Graveyard Book. No, keep going. Yeah, but um, I'm Robert J. Sawyer right now. Yeah. Terminal uh-huh. experiment. I recommend it. Yeah. Okay. No. You know what? This is something we talked about, and we were just talking about. Okay. In the movie business, marketing can absolutely destroy a good movie. And I bring this up because I just got on Blu-ray John Carter, and because I've been rereading the Edgar Rice Burroughs John Carter, the, the Barsoom series. Mm-hmm. James knows all about, I would say, we had a conversation exactly about John Carter, and James told me exactly why that movie tanked. And tell me, tell me, yes, because I liked that movie a lot. But why didn't you go see it in the theater? I did. Oh, I did. He's the one. He's the one. Yeah, I'm the kid. Kid. yeah. And of all the princesses Disney did not push and doesn't push, really? The Princess of Mars? The problem, Asia is, Thoris? The, the problem is, guys, is it should not have been a Disney movie. The, the reality of the situation is, is that the Barsoom Princess of Mars series is very sexual. It has taken on, and especially with the Frazetta art, it has taken on this kind of otherworldly, weird, almost Fellini-esque type landscapes and structures and people in very sexualized poses and things. And that movie did the exact opposite of that. And I think so many people who are familiar with the Presetta art, and that's what introduced them to the Princess of Mars series, they saw those trailers and they were like, this looks like it was something that was just shot in the desert. What What is this? And I, and I, I really think that's why it, it tanked. And I think oh. the John Carter, which, what does that mean? Yeah. They wouldn't call it Princess of Mars because Mars Needs Moms had just tanked at the box office, so they had a rule that you couldn't use the word Mars in the title, and they didn't want to use the word Princess because they thought that that would equate it with Disney princesses. So they changed the title from Princess of Mars to John Carter, John Car- and that meant nothing to anyone. Interesting. I did I not realize, realize that. Yeah. Now, do you think it would have been better if it had been created under another one of Disney's houses? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If it, if it was Touchstone or if it was something, it was, the, if, it was, if it was PG-13 or even a soft R film, I, th- I think it would have done incredibly well. And if they had made it look like one of those Presetta paintings that everyone thinks of when they think of Princess of Mars, it, it, rather than making it look like this Attack of the Clones thing. Interesting. That's how I would have shot it. That's just me as a director saying that's how I would have shot it, but whatever. <laughs> but that's why you're here, because we asked you, okay? So it's okay. I'm glad you answered. Now, that's that's very interesting because I I didn't even think about that. But I I had never read the books, and I have to admit I was not I was not interested in seeing the film at the time. But then again, I'm ex- Alan and I have become oh a bit lazy in what we go to see because it really it really has to be something that we think will knock our socks off it, it, because we have to drive so far to go see a film now. That that that, that book franchise took on such a life of its own when really that is started doing the artwork that he did and, 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 and created these landscapes of Mars that looked like, like I said, something from a Fellini film, just this incredible otherworldly 
you know, fantasy landscape of where the sky is weirdly colored and there's swirling clouds and there's weird pinnacles of rocks everywhere. You know, it's just it, 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 this beautiful artwork and they completely, and I know that Andrew Stanton, who directed it, consciously said, I don't want to do that world. I want to make this more like the original books, which is just basically Mars is a desert. And I think that's where they, I, I would say that's where they failed. Because wow. if that had been a really fantastical Fellini-esque epic, I think a lot of people would have visually just said, wow, that's a, you know, that's stunning looking. I want to go see that. Is there a set of books that you guys would want to, to do a, a current project of? I mean, I know Are You Are Aside. Are you, was Are You Are a book first or script first? It was, it was a play a, first. It was, it was a stage play. Right. Yeah. Um, but what about current book series? I mean, if you got to, if somebody got to throw you a shit ton of money and said, here, make, make this next season's Game of Thrones, but, you know, you get to pick an author's series of books to make, what would you do? Who would I you would, pick? I would do Never Ending Story, but I would do it wrong. <gasps> I, which I hear they're now remaking, but I would do, really. I would. I, I don't know if that's true, but I would do the trilogy, yeah. the three books from the original book that was divided into three parts, and do it exactly the way it was in the novel. Wow. Yeah. I like that. That's a really cool idea. Nick, you got others? Uh, yeah. Did you have any more? No, I'm good. Okay. Okay. Now you're approached by CBS, James. You're <laughs> directing a Star Trek film. You are given the green light <laughs> to kill a major Star Trek. Canon character. Which would you pick? And Kipley, you too. One who hasn't already been killed. Is this a prime universe thing, or is it it's an extension of the JJ universe, or what? I don't think we're going to limit that. No, I mean, I, if we just I know, major I major canon character. Yeah, I wouldn't limit that. I would let him choose. It could be if from because nobody's ever asked that question before. Everybody's always assumed prime universe. Because you know, like they already did kill Kirk, and yeah, yeah. Kirk's dead. Data's dead. <laughs> Spock you know, dies a couple times. Well, well, maybe well Spock's stuck back in time. And the other universe, so um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Tasha Yar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wesley. <laughs> oh. I'm kidding. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't. I, I gotta be honest with you. I don't know that I would be really interested in directing a big Star Trek film. You know, I guess we could all maybe agree on Janeway. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> You you know what though James and James and Kipley you both you both have the, the talent to be able to make the, te- the 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 story count on that though you'd find a way to take her out right wouldn't you <laughs> exactly yeah and make us all make the whole audience feel for her <laughs> One, once once yeah. MSC and commit suicide in the traditional female historical yeah, exactly. manner oh my god yeah manner, right she goes into her quarters and sulks for a while like she did for all those episodes and. She she yeah. drowns herself in chocolate and kittens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was so How awesome. about chocolate covered kittens? <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Even better. Tuvok walks you, in. She's just sitting up and watching cat memes all night. Q oh did bring her puppies. Q true, did bring her puppies, story, yeah. And then she shunned them, bitch. Okay, sorry. Because <laughs> they were not kittens. <laughs> What? Oh, God. <laughs> Mike's been hitting the blood wine. <laughs> oh, my God. I think we have, and that was it, wasn't it, Nick? Isn't there one more? That was the last one, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm uh, sorry. Somebody just offered me Bruno Mars tickets for Saturday. Damn it. <gasps> he, he's not from Mars. Sorry. <laughs> don't, don't buy into it. It's at Hershey Park. Oh. Um, I'm not going to give you chocolate. And oh, it won't well, be kitty. So, one more. Well, so, in closing, if you're coming to Star Trek Vegas, A, yes. come to the G&T show booth and get Kipley's autograph, and B, come to the screening of Star Trek Continues Thursday night at midnight at the AMC. And, and to also to follow up, I want to talk a little bit and have you be able to give people the information about how they can support and what they need to do to, I mean, to watch RUR Genesis, which is the short yes. that you have developed for the larger project which you were working on. How can people help support you with the larger project or is that closed now? Thank you. Well, well, right now, basically, uh, uh, the, the best way people can support RUR is to go and watch it on Vimeo or YouTube. Um, go to RURfilm.com. There's a link there. The more hits we get, the more publicity we get, um, the higher our chances are of getting greenlit as a feature. And that's what we're negotiating right now. Excellent. Excellent yeah. news. Well, you guys, we are so looking forward to seeing you in about three weeks. We um, 
are grateful that you're going to be joining us and we're Very excited so. for everything that is, is happening with both of your careers and thank you so much for being a part of our show tonight thank you thank you yeah it's been such, such fun <laughs> That's us. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Nick. Bye. Nick, Nick, take us out, babe. And thank you all once again for joining us for this GNT supplemental log with complaint number one and complaint number two, James Kerwin and Kipley Brown. And we will be posting many photos from the convention of me being a respectful distance away. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much for joining us. And Join us on Sundays at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific, and whatever it is in England. And I think that's Wednesday mornings in Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> Terry? Yeah. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you. Bye. 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 Joel Antro. GNT Show is a busy little beaver production. Music for the GNT Show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five-Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation.